I'll go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Tyna, if I haven't met you guys yet. Um, and welcome to our first uh, ASIP Industry Talks discussion. Um, we are doing it a little bit different this time. We've got a panel discussion. We've got some great panelists here um, that hopefully we'll be able to give a lot of our fellows a great opportunity to hear and ask about, um, hear and ask questions about non-clinical job opportunities in industry and tech. Um, and their personal experiences navigating this sort of um, uh, landscape. Um, we'd love to have a more open style discussion. So if anyone has questions, feel free to drop them in the chat, raise your hand, um, and, and we can keep the, the conversation kind of active. Um, on our panel today, we have Dr. Arlen Myers. Um, he is Professor Emeritus of ENT at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Um, he's got experience working in teams to create digital health companies and medical devices and a personal interest in providing non-clinical career guidance to physicians. Um, he is the current president and CEO of Society of Physician Entrepreneurs, which is a nonprofit open innovation entrepreneurship network um, that helps uh, physician entrepreneurs commercialize their biomedical ideas to patients um, by providing education, training, networking with potential investors. He's also the strategic advisor of MI10, if anyone has heard of it. It's a clinician-led healthcare AI education and adoption advisory group, um, which is fantastic. We have also, did I see um, Bob on here? Yeah. Oh, hey, Bob. Um, he is a member of FEMIA and associate clinical professor of the Department of Internal Medicine at BCU, uh, a creator and director of the medical informatics program at the University of West Florida. And he's done a lot of extensive research in clinical and informatics research and data science um, and lots of publications and lectures in these areas as well. Sarah, are you here? Did I see her? Yep, I'm here. Oh, hey, Sarah. Um, Sarah Sample, um, is it Rife? I'm sorry. You're fine, yes, it's Sarah Sample Rife. Okay, thank you. Um, is the past president of the Colorado chapter of uh, Health Information Management Systems Society, and she is the uh, current chief strategy officer of Zavaro, which is a Colorado-based consulting tech and services integrator. So um, her input will be highly valuable. And then we've also got Sharif Terraman, uh, the former division chief of pediatric neuro at Chalk, um, and associate professor of peds at UC Irvine. He is uh, an innovator, innovator, inventor, advisor of medical tech um, that has achieved breakthrough FDA designation and authorization um, for first of its kind use um, for autism spectrum diagnostic software um, being used as a medical device. He is the CEO of Cognoa, which is a behavioral health AI company um, for the diagnosing and treatment of neurodevelopmental and neurobehavioral disorders in children. So we've got a, a very esteemed panel today. Um, and I think we are gonna start off with uh, Dr. Myers going ahead and, and um, you've already shared your screen, um, presenting on how to find the job for fellows. Great, well, thanks a lot. And uh, thanks for having us all to uh, present this information. Um, we tried to put this panel together, as you can see, to, to uh, create a diversified uh, view of opinions because a lot of us have sort of different backgrounds. And while some of it overlaps, we've taken different journeys. So I'm just going to kick this off and set the stage for the other speakers um, and uh, directly address the issue uh, that we were asked to speak about is, OK, if you're a board certified uh, clinician and you're doing a fellowship or completing a fellowship in clinical informatics, um, uh, how do you find a non-clinical job? So um, I'm just going to go briefly through these slides. It shouldn't take any more than 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so the agenda is, uh, is exactly that. You know, it, this is sort of like a hands-on how to do it. Um, I, I've been pretty involved in non-clinical career development. And without belaboring the issue, I've gone through multiple career pivots and wound up doing what I'm doing now. Uh, I'm a my first job was as an uh, academic ear, nose, and throat facial plastic surgeon at the University of Colorado. Spent many, many years there doing straight up clinical academics and then wound up doing what I'm doing now. So uh, the idea is to create an updated, easy to read resume 
And uh, some of the highlights we're going to talk about is the, the is you really need a lot of networks and and a good connections to find a job. It's it's really about sure credentials matter, but that's really table stakes. This is really, in my opinion, about who you know, not what you know. Although what you know is becoming uh, more important in terms of competencies, and Bob will address you know what what does clinical informatics really mean, and in a job market what are the competencies they're looking for and is there a match? Um, and is there a good cultural fit with any potential company or a job role that you plan to uh, pursue? So at the end of the day, my impression is that the idea in doing this is to get employers to find you, not vice versa. Now that takes a while and it takes a lot of effort and you're working through a lot of noise but the point is that you really need to build a personal brand given uh, the way social media works and uh, virtual, um, if, not, if not artificial intelligence interviewing techniques. And things have radically changed over the last couple of years very quickly. And I'm sure Sarah can, can give us the inside baseball and how that's working. But essentially my view is what you're trying to do is get people to find you not vice versa. So how do you do that? Um, so I put together like a little checklist of here's stuff that you should be doing if you haven't already done it to get a job. So I call this the six. So it starts with really a career transitioning mindset. And I wrote a little piece on the six R's of career transitioning and these are the R's. So the way this works is before you start thinking about or pursuing something, you kind of have to have an idea of what works for you. What's your spot? What are you actually looking for? What would be your dream job? So you have to, you have to sit back and reflect on, on what are you good at? What are you not good at? What do you like? How much money do you want to make? Why are you doing this? I mean, is this a push or a pull or both? And this is probably actually the most important part of this whole thing. It's, it's really trying to come to grips with, I mean, what, what do you want to do and why do you want to do it? And how do you want to do it? Where do you want to do it um, for a start? Now you may not know, this is a lot like dating. You know, you, you wind up kissing a lot of frogs before you find out who the prince is. And it doesn't take very long like dating to find out what's going to work and what isn't. It's an experiment. So in a lot of respects, you're just, using divergent thinking, you're making the funnel big. Here are the, here's what I think should be in the funnel. Here's what shouldn't be in the funnel. And then eventually you're gonna narrow it down to something through, through experimentation. So then once you have sort of a broad outline of, well, here are some things I think I would like to do or places I would like to work or people I would like to work with, then you have to do some research in terms of secondary research, which is going on the internet and figuring out who's working for whom how did these people get there? What do these people know? Why do they like working there? And there's so much information, whether it's Glassdoor or whether it's a, some social media channel or whether it's directly calling people up and getting in contact with them and saying, hey, look, I'm thinking of doing what you're doing. How about we have an informational interview and you tell me what's the day in your life or, or, uh, and, and do you like it and why and what's a good fit for you? So once you then come into, um, so now you're sort of setting some parameters with what's a good fit. What am I about? What are the options about? And then what do I need to do to figure out whether one or more would be a good fit? And that means you have to have a personal and professional development plan, which means that if you look at a job description, for example, for a given job at a given place, that job description should really identify to you the knowledge, skills, abilities, and competencies you need to uh, have someone find you to fill the job. And this then gets into the issue of, well, in this day and age, everything's about artificial intelligence. So how much do you know, know how to do about artificial intelligence as a clinical informatics fellow? And Bob can address that issue. Uh, once then you are beginning to fill out the gaps and have a personal professional development plan, and a lot of this has to do with building your mindset, then you start looking for a job. 
and you reach out to social media, resources, coaches, et cetera, and begin to apply for jobs, and Sarah can address, well, what's the best way to do that in 2023? Then you finally land something. Somebody offers you an opportunity, whether it's paid, whether it's unpaid, whether it's a let's try before you buy, but it's an experiment. So you, you try to keep your options open. Um, you just never know how these things are gonna work out. The world's a round place, so you don't wanna annoy or, or, or create problems. And uh, you just experiment and try over and over and over again until you land in the right place. And then once you've landed the job, or the gig or whatever it is you're trying to do, um, then uh, I think you have an obligation to pass it forward, like things like we're doing now to inform your peers, spread the word with other clinical, clinical informatics fellows. Have you looked at this? Here's what I liked about that. I mean, that kind of stuff. So what are your options? So you, you've gone through this process and this process I just described is gonna take a while. I mean, it could take six months. So the sooner you, or a year, or even longer, or your entire life. I mean, you just never know where these things are going to go or when you want to make a career pivot. So uh, what are your options? Well, as far as I'm concerned, if you're a board certified clinician and you have a, a, a fellowship trained or board certification in clinical informatics, I see basically five options and maybe others can chime in with more. These are non-clinical careers. So you start your own company. That is, you be an entrepreneur and you're a startup founder. You be an intrapreneur, which means that you're an entrepreneur within your organization as an employee trying to add value through the deployment, in this case, of clinical informatics innovation, including artificial intelligence. You work in academia, which I imagine some of you will wind up doing. Maybe you are doing that now. Uh, and that could be edupreneurship. It could be a teaching role. It could be research. It could be those kinds of things that are non-clinical, could be tech transfer, it could be working in an innovation office, that kind of stuff. You work in industry and industry writ large. It could be drugs, devices, diagnostics, digital health, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, wh whatever industry you, because they're all basically, I mean, every industry these days, I don't care what it is, is a data industry that happens to do something. In the case of sick care, it's rapidly become a data industry that happens to take care of patients. So everything these days has become digitized, data-driven. Um, so you have to have that perspective. Or you do a side gig, which is advising, consulting. Maybe you're a mem member of a management team. You're a chief medical officer for a company, um, those sorts of things. And, and many of the people on the panel, fortunately, have had experiences, uh, good, bad, and ugly, uh, including myself in all of these. So we're happy to share the uh, uh, the lessons learned. And maybe before you go past that slide real quick, Arlen, I would uh, just encourage everyone to, to know that this is not a um, exclusive list. Um, so don't let anybody tell you that you can't do more than one thing. Um, so as you know, Tiana was reading my thing, you can hear like I work at UCI, but I also work in industry. You know, I do do advising and consulting, so you can do multiple things, and you can combine your passions. So don't let somebody tell you you can only do one thing. There's always ways to to combine things that you're interested in. Um, and again, you know, you all have um, a, a very uh, unique skill set that is in high demand, and so also know what your worth is. Um, and ultimately, if you say I want to do this thing, right? Uh, most of the time, because you have this, uh, you know, really interesting skill set, you, you can kind of demand that they allow you to do this extracurricular activity, um, you know, when, when you're negotiating. And so learning how to negotiate is super, super important. I would take it even one step further and say you should have a career portfolio. You should not focus just on one thing. Uh, and there are many, many reasons for that, not the least of which is you could get fired and you don't wanna put all your eggs in one basket. So I'm suggesting to you that you develop, as Sharif said, a portfolio of careers. And I like to call this a career ladder. It's like a bond ladder. You have five or six different things. And then if something doesn't work out at the bottom, you sort of get rid of it and move it up the food chain to something that has a higher value. We can, we can talk about that too, if, uh, if you'd like. Um, so, so what do you do? So, okay. 
you, you, you've done the overall view, you've sort of done your homework, you have a sense of maybe where do I want to play? So how do I do this? So I'm just going to briefly go through, and we don't have time to go over to every single one of these, because I just want to put them on the screen and put them on the radar so we can discuss them. Obviously, update your resume, clean up on social media, build your brand, find a mentor or a sponsor, absolutely positively grow your network, at both internally and externally, as quick and as robustly as possible. Match your skills to the job description. In other words, improve your competencies, knowledge, skills, and abilities. Um, figure out how you're going to do this. Are you going to do this from home? Are you going to find a side gig place? Are you going to do it in a co-working space? Are you? But it's not just the physical space because if you become an advisor or consultant and you have your own consulting business, then you really sort of need to figure out structuring it, finances, checkbooks, accounting, uh, credentials, uh, licensures, all that stuff, registering it with the Secretary of State's so office, all the stuff and organizing your own business, regardless of where it comes from, whether it's in an office, hybrid, or home. Uh, increasingly define what you want and learn from your experience. Pick your spot. It's, there's a lot of room to play in what we're talking about between all these different opportunities and the different industries that they represent. Uh, don't be surprised if you get ghosted. Don't be surprised if people don't return your calls. Don't be surprised if somebody tells you they're going to do something and doesn't do it. This is a numbers game and, and you don't have to be mean about it or, uh, uh, or, or get all nasty of it, but it, it is just what it is. I mean, it's a, it's a, and all of this has to do with this, the state of the economy. It has to do with what I call the microeconomics of a side gig. There are a lot of things that determine the supply and demand for jobs. And we're going to talk about that. And maybe, Sarah, you can give us some insight. You have to start practicing your interviewing skills, whether they're re in real time, remotely, artificial intelligence. Get somebody with a cell phone to role play with you and review your interviewing background. The obvious softball questions, how are you going to respond to them, et cetera. And like I said, you, you need to be persistent because this is really a numbers game. The more times, you know, the number of goals you, the number of goals you score depends on the number of shots you take. Uh, there's an issue that increasingly, there's more of an issue with compensation because of uh, laws that uh, don't allow you now to ask how much you get paid. So that's a whole salary negotiation thing that Sharif just brought up. You have to be really good at knowing how to negotiate for your salary and determining your value. And don't be shy about uh, asking for it. I mean, the literature indicates that women are not as good at this as men. Uh, whether that's true or not in an individual circumstance will vary, but that's what the literature seems to reflect. Uh, don't be so eager to get a side gig or a job that you're not, you're not going to say no. You're so flattered and ego driven that somebody wants to hire you, but then it's really not a good fit. And by the way, you knew it when you took the job. So don't be afraid to say no and, and learn from that experience. And then obviously learn from each interaction. So you really need to get started with all of this business. You can't just think about it. If you haven't done it yet, you need to start doing it tomorrow or when you hang up from this, it, from this session. So I'm gonna stop there and then I'm gonna turn it over um, to uh, uh, Bob uh, just to get started. Um, so Bob, given your background and what I've said, uh, what, uh, what would you like to offer? Yeah, well, thanks, Arlen. Great introduction. Uh, I, I was struck by one thing you said, which was basically uh, try to get them to come to you, not the other way around, which highlights an issue, I think, with informatics in general, and that's a branding issue. Do you really think that everybody in the C-suite at every hospital knows what a clinical informaticist does? Uh, the answer is no. Do you think they get it confused with medical informatics, health informatics, biomedical informatics, and bioinformatics? You bet they do. This was borne out in a study we did two years ago and reported in Applied Clinical Informatics, where we just did a basically a cross-sectional analysis of Indeed.com for health informatics. And what we found is they didn't, uh, most of the time, their definition of clinical informatics was a nurse with some IT experience. It was never a physician. 
And it was almost never somebody with formal training. So be aware that there is a branding issue. You and I know exactly what clinical informaticists do, but certainly not everybody does. And, and that's somewhat of an obstacle. Another point that maybe Sharif can also build on is traditionally companies like Big Pharma and others, they are looking for physicians largely for your clinical experience and less for your technical know-how. Uh, in other words, and that's true of nurses as well, they will hire you because you know how hospitals work, offices work, you understand workflow, and you understand the challenges uh, of practicing medicine. They find that unusually helpful. And so they plan to give you on-the-job training regarding whatever technology they're using. Uh, so that's that's the good news. And I, I'd be curious to see if Sh Sharif thinks that's true today. It was traditionally true uh, when I was more involved in informatics. Now, in terms of uh, future directions, which was mentioned, uh, I'm a little biased. In the last five years, I devoted all of my time to data science, uh, data literacy, uh, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. And I can tell you that that is a feather in your cap if you're the one person people can go to uh, for any of those three, again, you're very data literate. You know how to locate, analyze, explore data. Machine learning, you know how to create a predictive model. And AI, you know simply about AI, how AI is being applied to include, of course, uh, everybody's favorite, all the language models like chat GPT. So I'm just saying as a side gig, uh, if you will, not really a gig, side knowledge, I, I find that to be an asset for most people. Uh, and with that, I'll stop for a moment for further comments. I'll weigh in real quick. I mean, to, to Bob's point, I think a lot of it is about, um, you know, as you are getting out there and you work on projects, finding opportunities to present that information. I'll tell you that the current gig that I have, which is now CEO of a company, started as a chief medical officer role. And the reason that I got that gig is because I was co-presenting with the founder of the company on a panel at AI Med on use of AI in neuroscience. And, you know, that led to, hey, you should come up to Silicon Valley and check out my lab. And next thing you know, I was being asked, hey, we need a chief medical officer. Can you do this position for me? So there's a couple really good conferences um, kind of in that space. I'll put those in the chat for you. They're ones that you might think about presenting at or conferences like that, not necessarily endorsing any specific one. Um, but those are, I think, a really good resource. And to, to Bob's point, you may get pulled in because, you know, I, I'm a cardiologist and, you know, this cardiology company, I'm not a cardiologist, by the way, but this cardiology company is looking for a, for a clinician, but then you can kind of come in and say, oh, but I understand data and I understand data intelligence and I understand clinical informatics. And then that is going to position you well above potentially another candidate that's that's also maybe vying for that CMO type role. Sarah, thoughts? Sarah, you know, Sarah do you want to chime in? And, um, I was going to add to that. <clears throat> Absolutely. So I think well, all of the points are very valid. I, it's very important to decide what you're passionate about, however. So if data is not your passion, it's going to be a hard uh, role for you to take because you're not going to enjoy it. And informatics was really erupted after the clinical systems, Cerner, Epic, EHRs came about, and now it's really prevalent. It used to be only hospital driven, but to Bob's point and Cherie's point, almost every organization has a dedication in healthcare, whether it's Accenture, Deloitte, whether it's Optum and uh, the payers, the pharmas. My company, I run our healthcare vertical, we're a technology company as well. So it's very important to know what you want out of this. And then getting your LinkedIn profile is critical. So LinkedIn is very powerful for your network. You can join different groups in it and you can actually see all the positions. If you're looking for dollars, you can also go to Indeed and you can type in informatics around the country and see what they're, what the pay is looking for right now. So you know where you start from. So Sarah, uh, can you, uh, let me just stop a minute and open up for some questions from people in the audience, if you have some, what specifically that we're talking about 
and what, what's top of mind? What are you dealing with now? What's happened? So one question while you're thinking about that is how much should I expect to get paid? And so, and I, obviously it depends on the role and the industry and what it is you're being asked to do. But, but Sarah, let's, how do you deal with that question? What, how do you negotiate a salary these days? What should, what's the expectation? My, my start for it always is, you know, on, on my little role that you started with the six questions or the six steps, what do you need to be um, earning to be comfortable? And I'm not saying, you know, a million dollars a person, but where, where do you personally have to be comfortable? Because you don't want to take a role less than that. So that needs to be your starting line. Um, most companies have their dollars in their budget. And if, if you ask for 600,000 and they say, we can only pay four, then you start there. Um, you, you need to, to command your worth, but you need to know what that looks like as well. So it's really getting in tune with yourself on that. The other part, as I mentioned, you can move to Indeed. You can look up an informatics role, different companies, and see what the baseline is paying in different regions of the country. But that's my advice on that. I'm sure Sharif has some too. Yeah, I was just going to, Matt put a really good uh, a point in the chat, which is don't don't limit yourself to informatics terms. Um, so uh, you should probably have like a job search. You can do this on LinkedIn as an example. You can put in like keywords. So you can put chief medical officer and then just put like, if there's a region, location, are you looking for only hybrid or remote positions? Um, you can put stuff in medical device, you can put pharma, you can put insurance companies, you know, that are medical roles. And then again, maybe don't limit yourself to a specifically quote unquote informatics position. You want to leverage the informatics position potentially as sort of the selling point, the thing that makes you special, the thing that actually gets you the gig. But, you know, uh, like if you have a chief medical officer job search filter that throws C CMO roles at you, then you can figure out like, oh, which ones do I want? Or obviously there's like CMIO and chief health information officer type stuff as well. Um, the other thing too, is like experience begets experience. So, you know, as much as we're telling you, like, know your worth, sometimes doing like a little gig, maybe at a little bit less competitive pay early on, and then being able to say like, oh my gosh, like I took this thing through the FDA or, you know, I helped do this really cool thing gives you something on your resume or on your CV. That's an experience builder that then says like, you know, I can demand a premium Right. So like I have lots of people that come and are, they're always bugging me saying like, hey, we need your help getting breakthrough status from the FDA. And literally, like I can charge whatever I want. Like it's like you really want that. This is what my going rate is. And I, I don't I never get anybody who's like, what? That's too much. And trust me, I think it's actually too much. And I'm, I'm, I'm very, very shrewd about like telling them like this is how much at my time's worth. Well, and I'm going to expand on that. That's exactly Exactly. And Arlen put in the chat, you know, to work for free, sometimes for a limited amount. One point I've made as I've been through recruiting over a decade is we spend more time looking for our, someone we're going to be part in a partnership with in our home life. We spend more time at work than we do in our home partnership. And we spend less time interviewing and actually digging into what is it we want to have come out of that. So it is really important to spend the time to know what, what, what are you passionate about? I mean, sure. The FDA, pushing through. I'm sure that's not your passion, but you know, you can do it. So you do. Yeah. Um, so Jacob, or actually let's start with Matthew. Matthew, uh, you have some good points. Did you want to amplify on your question and maybe tell us who you are? Oh, sure thing. Um, yeah, Matt Sakamoto, um, virtual and primary are, care doctor based, based out of San Francisco. Are, I'm an alum, San, San Francisco um, CI alum out of UCSF, but I hang out with ASF fellows because I never leave. Uh, but no, uh -huh. and, and I, I did, <laughs> so I do work both uh, from a clinical informatics operations standpoint in a traditional health system, but also do a lot of side gig work. So no, a lot of things that I kind of just wanted to amplify is, yeah, I think beyond the word in, informatics, just like I was, I was mentioning down there, um, I think for me, that's opened up a lot of doors. And then the one other piece is analytics and data is one side. I'm probably more front end operations workflow so that people process Part of um, informatics is probably the thing that I lean in heavily towards, and a lot of places don't know how to put together a workflow or communications, um, inter-office communication in a virtual environment. So these are things that I think 
fellows are very good at. Um, and it's a skill set again, just beyond the data analytics part. If pure okay. data stuff is not your jam. Agreed. Great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Jacob Kinsey, do you want to, I'm a little confused about your question. Can you amplify that? So um, we do a lot oh, of different types. Hi, I'm Jacob. Yeah, hi, yeah, and where are you? I'm at Houston Methodist. I'm currently a uh, clinical informatics fellow. Um, mm -hmm. Following this year, I'm going to be doing another fellowship, a two-year fellowship in HLA. And so um, this year, I've actually had uh, one contact where a lab director reached out to me directly on LinkedIn and you know, asking me to apply for a position based on my LinkedIn profile and, you know, my clinical informatics or whatever you want to call it experience is limited to Houston Methodist. I've never seen it anywhere else. I don't know if it's different other places than here. So they described the position to me and it was exactly what we do here. And, um, you know, and I enjoy those things. I enjoy, you know, go going to get the data, um, to support um, decision making on how we do things in our lab, um, and you know all the other the the kind of cleanup side of our of our Epic implementation many years ago, and we're we're still kind of cleaning up that stuff, and a bunch of other you know more traditional kind of um, informatics uh, type activities. Um, but what I really enjoy is is building applications. Um, specifically like in HLA, um, it's a very niche field, um, and there's just not vendors to support a lot of the things we do. And a lot of the things we do are super automatable. Um, and, and the, some of the, the vendor provided solutions we have are, are still pretty technical and hard for people with minimal training to, to use. And so I enjoy building those things, but I'm just not sure if there's a market for that. And since I do like doing those type of activities, I'm kind of looking for where there's even a need for that. And um, uh, I, I was just wondering if, if, if people in the field that, you know, if anybody is doing that type of thing and where they have found um, to even look for jobs where that's wanted. So Sarah, do you wanna ask, you wanna answer that? What's, what's hot, what's not, what's you looking for? You said a keyword right now, um, Automation is so hot. I've had six calls this week with executives and it's what Wednesday on automation exclusively. So, you know, back to don't, to what Matthew said, don't, don't limit yourself to informatics. Don't limit yourself to hospital informatics. Don't limit to clinical informatics. Using the word automation, if you enjoy technical, the world is an, is an oyster. Like there are so many opportunities with, um, automation right now. And so because someone is looking for decision support, a lot of organizations didn't even have a CMIO or CNIO 10 years ago. So it's still a growing field and it's a lot to teach, um, to educate the organizations of what they're actually looking for. So you, you kind of have to lead them to the water sometimes. Sharif, uh, as in your role as a CEO of your company, I, I don't know how much you're recruiting now or, or what your uh, workforce is, but what, so you're on both sides of the table, at least you were, what, what are you looking for? If not now, what would you be looking for in employee number six or whichever one it is? Yeah, I think it depends on what the role I'm trying to fill. Um, I think from an informatics perspective, I mean, I think you know, the things that I, I think are important for you to work on during your training is is showing demonstrable projects, right? I mean, if you came to me and you're like, hey, I did an informatics fellowship, I'd be like, great. What did you actually do in your informatics fellowship? So on your, you know, LinkedIn profile, on your CV, it's not sufficient to just put, I did an informatics fellowship. I think you need to really highlight, um, you know, the accolades that you did during your training. I worked on this project. I automated this lab system. I implemented this, you know, thing in the emergency department. I wrote this AI algorithm, whatever it is that you're doing. So making sure that you're a documenting, do working on projects and then documenting those projects and what you did. Those are the thing that things that are really going to um, uh, pull you forward. Uh, and then just just because it happens, I'm actually getting a phone call from a recruiter as we speak right now. 
Um, connecting with recruiters is actually not a bad thing. I think people are sometimes a little bit hesitant on it. Usually, like if I'm looking for a very specific niche position and that's hard for me to fill, I will use a recruitment firm to help me find the person. And so if you're connected with multiple recruiters, you will find that jobs will start coming. And if you have your sales open, you're going to catch those wins and you're going to find opportunities that you don't even know existed um, that fit your profile because that's what the recruiters are looking for. They they like to have a pool of candidates that they can reach out for for the different people that they're doing. So uh, I, I would accept, as long as they're a legitimate recruiter, accept those recruiter requests on LinkedIn. And you can also set your profile that says you're open for a position. Uh, although I'm not currently open for a position, right? It doesn't hurt to have a relationship with a recruiter because you never know. They might find something for you. Well, and to Cherie's point, that's exactly it. I was in recruiting for over a decade. Um, it was a dirty word to me when I first joined the industry. And I, I found every person I worked with, I found them on LinkedIn almost exclusively or at a networking event, you know, through Hims or Chime, different organizations that I'm, I'm a member of. Also through SOAP, right? So through different organizations that I belong to, but it is really critical to have a good rapport with recruiters because a lot of them are very good, especially the ones that focus only in informatics or focus in clinical um, technology. I would, those three things, clinical technology and informatics are keywords that I would utilize in looking for careers and opportunities. So Sarah, what are the do's and don'ts of working with uh, and using the term gently, headhunters, professional, whatever you folks like to be called. These <laughs> headhunters kind of was like calling a doctor, a provider. I don't want to annoy you. So what? Whether it's an executive search profession, how about that? There you go. Um, There's a difference, though. There is a very big difference. Yeah, you're are... right, and that's yeah. That's what I want you to explain. What What are the ins and outs of working with per, a person? who is going to help you find or source a job. So it's it's back to Sharif even mentioned this a bit too. It's finding that recruiter who who can explain the organization to you. They actually spend a minute asking you, Michael, to your point, they spend a minute asking you about you. What are you passionate about? Your your LinkedIn should say what you want to do. So if you want not to be called about internal medicine, make sure it says passionate about informatics technology, clinical um and, and this is the only place that it's prevalent to use the word I, I did, I did, but the recruiters, they, they should ask about you first. Um, if you were dating someone and they're busy saying, hey, I've got this job, I would move on, right? They're going to talk to you about that position, but if they're not asking about you first, they're just trying to fill a position and you're not going to hear from them if you're not a fit for that. They're just going to go away. If you build a relationship with the ones who actually get to know you, who are invested in what you're looking for and have ideas of other companies, they'll continue to have that conversation with you. So Michael, and, not to call you out, but like looking at your LinkedIn profile, like I'd love you to put like a little bio or like summary of like who you are, what you're looking for. Cause I mean, right now it just says you're a clinical informatics fellow at U University of Kansas, but like in your like bio line, put like, you know, passionate about whatever the thing it is, right. And what you're looking for, I think is super helpful because then and also too, you can even like, like engage with, with posts and or topics that you're interested in. So like, I don't know, maybe you can come off mute or type it in the chat. Like if you're interested in, in something specific, you know, the, the other one too, honestly, like there's tons of jobs within Epic and Oracle Cerner. And, you know, there are, you know, physician informaticist roles within EMR companies. And that's always an opportunity um, they're always looking for people. I agree. And we're also talking about non-clinical jobs. So, I mean, in this day and age where manpower shortages are the number one issue on the minds of CAEOs, everybody's trying to fill the seats. They're trying to find primary care docs and anybody who will show up and stay there to work. They're not interested in informatics. And oh, by the way, so what I'm, my point is a medical staffing firm is much different than what we're talking about. This is a non-clinical gig. This is not, I want to be an internist in wherever. Uh, and the second point is 
that this has to do with, a lot of this has to do also with money. And maybe Bob, you can talk about this. If, if you look at the competition for top-notch data scientists in industry, I mean, I'm talking X, Meta, Google, they're paying a fortune for data scientists. And there's lots of them from all over the world. But if you are a clinician with a clinical informatics background looking for a non-clinical data science, for example, job, no one is going to pay you that amount of money. I don't care where you work. So maybe, Bob, you can, you can comment on that in terms of what is a realistic expectation for a clinician informaticist that wants to do this kind of work, admittedly non-clinical, but stick in sick care? Because you're not going to get paid as much money as people that get amazing salaries working for Google. Yeah, I mean, those are all valid points. I can't tell you what the going rate is for a physician in that position. I can tell you that they published the data scientist salaries for 2023, uh, in the United States at least, and they're about 160 to 180 with a huge standard deviation though. Just keep that in mind. Uh, but if you put in there an MD degree plus that, I really can't say what that would do. So uh, I'm just trying to encourage people to pick up as many additional skills as you can. Some of you are fortunate, maybe you had some engineering background or you had some additional skill set before you ever either went to medical school uh, or whatever. And, and you should definitely leverage that if you're going know, to be at programming, whatever additional thing that you uh, have learned. Hey, Jay, you want to ask? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, that's fine. Um, Bob, you had mentioned some great points earlier about some soft skills that we acquire through fellowship. What are um, so some good ways for fellows to kind of project that um, to lawyers. Yeah, well, I As think <clears throat> what has come up with uh, more than just informatics, but data science as well, is they're worried that they'll get people that are technically sound, but can't communicate anything to the end user or the C-suite. Uh, we, we know that that's an issue, at least in computer science. But I think that's where you excel. And so in your CV or resume, I would definitely say excellent communicator, have a tradition of communicating among all clinical staff and non-clinical staff, uh, that types of thing. Maybe you help create a dashboard. Uh, anything that indicates that you work well with others and that you communicate well uh, really should be in your resume. I would say that um, uh, results talk and you can have all the credentials and courses and whatever, but, and I think this is something that the clinical informatics fellowship community needs to think about. How do you provide fellows with the opportunities to get experience in the soft skills without being afraid of failure and demonstrate competencies and results as a result of doing it. People want to know, what, like Sharif said, what have you done and what did you accomplish? Well, if you don't really have a hands-on experiential learning opportunity in leadership, communication, complex decision-making, collaboration, you know, the five C's of soft skills, then nobody really knows what you've done and what you've accomplished. And I think that's in part the, the clinical informatics community and others. I'm not talking, I'm talking about everybody in medicine these days, residencies, training. We need to own up to that. And it's a failure of leadership development in a lot of physician leadership development programs. So you just basically have to give people a place to play. You got to give them a sandbox to fail. And if they don't have a place to play and learn from that, then everything else, in my opinion, is just soft skill theater. 
Can I, uh, I'm going to answer one question that is on the chat from AJ um, about the value of formal training. Uh, this is uh, my little soapbox for a second. Can we all advocate for U.S. News and World Report to add clinical informatics fellowship as one of the fellowships that get you points on that stupid survey? Um, because that actually is going to help drive it forward and I think help uh, formalize that formal training is important. Um, so if if any of you can kind of help with that and do that groundswell, I think that that's good for us as a community. Um, and then the other one, which was Anthony, about your really long academic CV, I think you want to kind of have both. I think you want to have the one pager, you know, uh, highlighting how awesome you are for industry type thing, um, you know, maybe in front of like a summary and then you can also give them sort of the, here's the everything CV academic version. Uh, you should write cover letters though too. And those cover letters should be specific to the thing you're applying for and um, highlighting that you understand what their business model is, what they're trying to do and why you're the best person for that position. And I think that that's another opportunity where you can highlight the formal training versus you know just winging it and I have background in this uh, type of stuff. So Sarah, what, what advice would you give about the difference between what your LinkedIn profile is designed to do, what a resume is designed to do, and what a CV is designed to do? Yeah. Right. I agree to with Sharif here. And I would I would be cautious on applying for jobs online. Um, I would try to do them through LinkedIn because you can see where you are in the ranking as well. Online is like a dead black hole for most companies and if you don't have the keywords they eliminate you from the um the software it's not even a person who does so your your linkedin should absolutely be the same as your cover letter and your um one pager for example it should very much highlight where you've been what you're looking for i see some people put on their linkedin I worked at Northwestern University. I, I don't know what you did there. I have no idea. I don't pick up keywords. So the things that you want to promote, LinkedIn should absolutely um, match that and articulate that for you. And then your CV is, is where, as I said in the chat, you want to get into the CV when you're further down in the conversation to show them everywhere you've been. I had a um, military colonel who was coming out in from Madison and he had every single place he'd ever been stationed. I said, no one cares about that. And like, I love you, but no one cares that you've been all over the world doing these things until you're later on in the conversation, because it's just too much for one person. You have about, a recruiter will give you about 3.5 seconds in reviewing your resume to see if they see what they're looking for or not. A hiring manager gives you about five to seven seconds. So you really have to impress upon the immediate look. And so, you know, in the, in the dating firm, you don't put your your profile up on a dating website and expect someone to go through 19 novels. It's quick, it's in, you're out, and you're, you're in or no, yes or no. That's why swiping is so important, right? Yep. <laughs> I, I'm out of the dating scene, but I will tell you. Uh, <laughs> Me too. Maybe it may be a good tip if you're looking for someone to date slash looking for a job. The, the personal connection also is super important. So if you're applying to a job at, you know, soap let's say and arlen's a hiring manager and you're like oh you know what like i'm connected to arlen through bob i'm gonna be like hey bob can you go put a good word in for me and drop <laughs> arlen a note that i applied for the position because guess what your resume when i post a job at my company like i am flooded there's literally like ten thousand resumes that are coming in and like we have, yeah, we've got automated systems to filter. And then I'm like, hey, uh, my HR person, can you go do a first pass and like weed out all the nonsense? And, you know, you you might get weeded out, even though you're fantastic for the job. It's just like, you know, I got like a couple seconds to just like click and be like, is this, is this legit or not? You know, and we use uh, something called Breezy. So I'm like, you know, moving people in the different columns. And I'm like, all right, here's five people that I've identified that I think we should just interview. And if you're in the pool of what I'm, I'm going to miss you. Right. So, so unless somebody calls me and says, Hey, by the way, you know, Sarah's applying for the job. I'm not going to know to go pull her resume out of the, the masses of people that got, that are interviewed for that position. So you want to get that. I'm applying for this thing. Who do I know that works at the company? Do I have a connection to somebody? Cause that's going to help you get your foot in the door and get an interview. 
I know how much time, how much more time do we have? Not until one, but we can certainly go a little over. Um, okay. It's a lot of good All right. The other, the other point I want to make is that when, so good, now somebody is interested in hiring you and that you get, you get contacted, you did it all right. Someone finds you rather than vice versa. Then the question, then they say, well, I want to, I want to interview. Let's set up a time to do a zoom or whatever. Um, and the tip I would give you is one that don't assume that the person who is contacting you understands what you do, what they want you to do, how they want to hire you, under what terms and conditions of an engagement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This particularly applies to startups. Um, and you're a clinical informaticist and some startup says, gee, I saw your resume stuff, LinkedIn, whatever. You look like a good fit. Do you want to, you know, let's talk about you being an advisor. Uh, a lot of times they don't understand, they don't know how to speak doctor to, 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 to reference one of the chat points. And you may not know how to speak business. So the point is that it's kind of the blind leading the blind and, and you need to sort of clarify the expectation and make sure that each other understand each other and are not talking past them. That's number one. Number two is, and so when someone says, you come to it and say, well, how much, you know, there's three questions that you sort of start off with. One um, uh, is uh, what role do you want me to play? And what is the problem you're trying to solve that you think I can help you solve? Be a problem seeker, not a problem solver at this stage of the game. What are you doing? And is that something that interests me? It may have nothing to do with what I like. And so that's the end of the conversation to Sarah's point. It's not a good fit. It's not what I'm interested in doing. Number two, Okay, now I understand the problem you're trying to solve and the role you want me to play. Arlen, I want you to be an advisor. Second question, what are your roles and what are your expectations about terms and conditions, deliverables and timelines? How much, what do you want me to do? How much is this job, gig, side gig, whatever, going to involve? What is the cost in terms of time, energy, social capital, connections, et cetera? And the third question is, how are you offering to compensate me to do this? So at the end of the day, it's a cost benefit. I understand what the costs of my engagement will be personally and professionally. And I understand what you're offering in terms of benefits. And if you start with that conversation, it'll, in my experience, it's eliminated a lot of heartburn and wasted time and dead ends and dates that don't work and disappointment and bad feelings and everything else. So be very, very clear about the, the expectations when it comes to costs and benefits. Right, and to elaborate on that, Harlan, you hit a great point. When I said earlier, be clear with yourself on what you, <clears throat> what, what compensation you need to be comfortable in your life. It's, you need to ask the question, what is the total compensation? Not just what is the salary? Because total compensation is very different there can be stocks, there can be bonuses, there can be a lot of different things that are on the table for that. Right, um, and we and let me just make one more point, Sharif, and then I'll, uh, you can have your comment. This, but this business about equity, we could talk a lot about the issues concerning equity. We don't have time to do that. Maybe we can do this in another conversation. But her point is very well taken. That is, it's compensation, cash alone, equity alone, cash plus equity, some combination, project boost, whatever. You, you sort of need to understand the different models of how you're going to get paid in the ins and outs. Sharif? I was going to say, like, I don't know um, if the group, ha if there's people in the group that are actually really interested in, in doing the sort of like, I want to start my own startup thing. If that's something, I don't know if we want to yeah, get into but, yeah, let's get, yeah, or so not. But... Give us, give us your, your wisdom on, so do you really think you want to have a startup? Yeah, so so that is a very challenging um, thing to do, um, especially if you don't have experience in in, in doing it. Um, there are a number of like accelerators and programs that can help support you in that journey. I actually like them a lot. Um, so in one of my side lives, I did um, something called MedTech Innovator, which is actually a program that's run by the FDA 
that gives funds to help uh, like pediatric device development. And so I was in the pediatric device development cohort. That was actually a more traditional physical medical device, but there are ones that are around informatics type, um, you know, software as a medical device or application-based type things. Um, hackathons are also super cool. I think those are great ways to kind of meet people who are more entrepreneurial and can help facilitate and get you going. You know, there's always this kind of like worry about sharing your ideas. I think you do need to be smart about who you share ideas with because obviously you don't want someone to like steal your idea and there are potential IP implications if you disclose your your invention or your idea before you can get IP. But most of the time, I think I'm I'm in line of more of like sharing more than less because typically I can usually get other people to kind of do the dance with me and support me in that endeavor. So, you know, maybe some just general thoughts about I want to do a startup type thing and and go and do my own my own business, right? Um, but you got to find smart people to support you for all the areas that you have no idea what you're doing. You also, I had a, yeah, just in terms of the startup world, which I sort of play in a lot, uh, you really have to understand what you're getting yourself into when you make that commitment. And, and, and that's a big deal. So, um, I mean, I, I, I wound up being an accidental entrepreneur. I had absolutely no clue what the hell I was doing and I wound up doing what I'm doing. But if I had to do it again, uh, I would have done a lot more circumspection about what do I really want to go down this road? Uh, it's a good news, bad news story because you learn a tremendous amount from failure and trying stuff and it doesn't work and all that. But um, if you want to have that conversation, we can do that offline, but but you really need to know what you're getting yourself into. It's a tremendous commitment. I think that'd be a great follow-up conversation. I think a lot of people are really interested to hear about everyone's personal kind of experiences um, navigating this. If um, I can uh, touch base with you guys offline as well. Yeah. So it sounds like uh, from the chat that we've touched on a lot of points. I'm happy, or I can't, I can speak for myself. I'm happy to do this again. And hopefully the rest of the panel, because they're great, can, can chime in. Um, but it sounds like uh, this issue of compensation, what about equity? What about stock? What about options? What do I do? What are liabilities? All that stuff. And, uh, you know, this whole startup mentality, and is that something you really want to do? I'm happy to do it. Absolutely. I agree. I, and I encourage everyone to remember it's about connections. And, you know, I'm open for connections if you want to connect as well. Uh, maybe Sarah and Arlen and Bob can throw their uh, LinkedIn's in the chat too real quick. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. You don't have to accept yeah. their invite, yeah. Sarah. No, you don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> Some would advise when it comes to me, be careful what you ask for. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, now you can just look me up on you know, LinkedIn and I'm all over the well, place. If you, so. I gave you all my LinkedIn. You can stock my LinkedIn as all you want. I don't care. Yeah. Um, <laughs> mine's on there. It's really long. That's why I'm not putting it in. Yeah. There right. you go. Right. And, and, and just a kind of funny story about LinkedIn, since we're talking about that, and then I guess we have to go, is that... Uh, you know, the, the, purpose of the, the purpose of a LinkedIn profile is uh, to tell your personal story. It's to, it's to give people a feel of the kind of person that you are. And it's more about tone than just sort of the words. And just for fun, I, I, you know, I put on my LinkedIn profile that I'm a lousy golfer. And the number one reason people comment on my LinkedIn profile is that I'm a lousy golfer. Has nothing to do with anything I've achieved, what I've done, all the initials, blah blah blah. It 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 just says something about your personality, and so my tip to you is when you do the about section in LinkedIn, that's probably the most important part of the whole profile, and think about it and and create a persona, like why would someone want to connect to you or date you for that matter? Yep. I agree. And I do you have one person that did find their spouse and got married on LinkedIn? I can't remember who was telling me this. And I will okay, show you mine. They uh I, I did I let AI 
generate mine the other day. So go look at it. It looks like I was at a Grateful Dead concert because I'm changing it quickly. <laughs> did it just yeah. to like throw it out there because they, they do now offer an AI solution to go through your LinkedIn. So just be careful with it. And I left it there for contention. Um, any was, more questions? Was AI generated for you, Sarah, on your profile? <laughs> <laughs> it, AI, AI, now that LinkedIn's offering that. So they went through my profile and it, it says technology yeah. is one of the minds greatest play i don't know it sounds like i was at a grateful dead oh concert. like you're i got you you're like um yeah your bio thing no, right. but it is changing uh, maybe back right. any other any other questions before we quit we're, we're happy to sit here for another couple minutes you got us if anyone has any questions you can just unmute yourself well let me ask you a question based on your uh in based on what we've just spoken about for the last hour, what's missing in bioinformatics education and training? I think um, career development, I think could um, be elaborated on a little bit more. And I really liked um, our discussion on the importance of the soft skills. We pick up a lot of projects um, throughout our fellowship experience. And I think sometimes we, kind of forget some of the more important skills that we pick up along the way while we're, you know, working on the deliverables of each of these individual projects. And so trying to figure out how to project those to potential employers, um, I think is a skill that a lot of us um, would be interested in, as well as definitely the financial aspect in terms of compensation that I think would be a great follow-up discussion. Yeah, I'm ha we're happy to talk about all this stuff. Uh, and another comment is that, you know, there's a notion that what got you here won't get you there. In other words, what made you a doctor is not going to make you a data scientist. It is not going to put you in a new career. That actually is not, there's a whole book written about that title. What got you here won't get you there. So the idea is lifelong learning, continuous improvement, talent, blah, blah, blah. Actually, my view of that is it's not entirely true because as clinicians and certainly as data people, you have a tremendous number, we have a tremendous number of transferable skills into other industries, but we just don't recognize it for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is the culture of medical education. So I would encourage you to, again, in the first R, the, the re, uh, to be reflective, what are your transferable skills in terms of leadership? And Bob has mentioned several of them in terms of project management, in project product management, in terms of conflict resolution, et cetera, it's complex problem solving, stuff that has transferable application to business or wherever you want to do it. So without further ado, we really appreciate, I think we all had fun doing this. It's great to meet everybody. Uh, now you know who we are, feel free to get in touch with us. And if you want us to do some more of this stuff, I'm sure we'd all be happy to do it. So thanks a lot and good luck. Good luck in everyone in training and career paths. Take care. Right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.